All right, thanks uh, everyone for having me here. Uh, it's a bit of an unusual talk that I'm giving. I hope it will be fine. Uh, the reason being, I, I spoke at Yale just a year ago, and of course, since then, it's been the pandemic. That was, I think, my last travel before the pandemic. And so during the pandemic, we got no new data. So I could give the same talk, but I thought that we could also mix it up a little and do something slightly different. So I think I gave a title uh, for the talk that is uh, that was less cryptic. But I really want to basically talk about two theoretical ideas. They're not so abstract. So I, I understand that you recently had David Rosenthal here, and he's a he's a real philosopher. I'm I'm not a real philosopher. I'm not even a philosopher of any kind, in fact. But I do incorporate uh, philosophy ideas into my work. And um, so basically, um, I think today I'll talk about basically two theoretical ideas borrowed from philosophy. One is called PRM, Perceptual Reality Monitoring, and the other is called MQS, Mental Quality Space. But it's not exactly a philosophy talk because I'm not a philosopher. So instead, I would take the ideas from these people, uh, and uh, Austin Clark, uh, David Rosenthal, and Bill Lycan, and these philosophers who have spelled out ideas that could help us to address the nature of subjective experience. And I will provide some empirical and computational arguments in favor of these views. So taken together, I think that 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 the conclusion will be helpful is that maybe to study consciousness, a lot of people think that you need to go very metaphysical and, and philosophical. But my hope is you don't. If you take some of these rather relatively mainstream philosophy ideas, and turns out you can provide pretty strong empirical arguments in favor of them and make sense of them using the language of cognitive science, then it means that most of the remaining work is actually empirical. Um, OK, so that's my game plan. So where do we start? Um, there's a way to think of why I start doing this kind of work. I mean, I, 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 I co-authored with Rosenthal about 10 years ago. We reviewed some evidence in favor of what we called a higher order theory of consciousness, which I can explain in a minute what it is. So, so far, so good. I don't need to dabble into philosophy. But I think um, the, the reason I need to, or I wanted to, is because of the following. Um, when you actually look at the neural correlate of consciousness, that is, you do experiments and compare, you know, conscious seeing versus non-conscious visual sensing, if you do it properly, uh, which is very difficult, uh, or fairly difficult at least, but if you do it properly, I would argue what you found is that the neural correlates of consciousness looks a lot like the, the neural mechanisms for metacognition. They look incredibly similar. And by metacognition, I mean when you do a, let's say, a visual task, I can also ask you to how well you're doing the task. And that ability is what I call metacognition here. And the, the neural mechanism looks very similar. And likewise, if you don't think about these neural correlates, if you just think about the, the biological uh, or, the, or the behavioral pattern. If I ask you to think about what your uh, peripheral vision is like in the background, you are probably going to say that it is more like a picture here than here. So it's relatively uniform and not grayscale and, and very impoverished in the, in, the, in, the, in the periphery. But if you think about the retina, the, the, the eyeball itself, actually you don't have a lot of cone cells in the, in the periphery, right? It's not like your color sensitivity is absolutely zero in the periphery, but it should be pretty low if you think about the, the, the biological constraints. And yet somehow we seem to inflate the background and, and make ourselves think that it's relatively uniform. And if you go to the psychophysics and think about it, again, it seems to have something to do with metacognition there. It's not that you actually see color in the periphery. I mean, you can one, one possibility is you top down filled in the, the, the uh, sensory representations, uh, but that doesn't seem to be sufficient to account for all the data. What happens is you might not have a very good uh, representation of the uh, peripheral color details and high resolution details, but somehow you inflate and make yourself think that you've, you're seeing um, those stuff. So it's a kind of metacognitive inflation, if you will. Um, so together it means that like maybe consciousness is a lot like metacognition, but I'm sure that nobody really honestly think that they're the same. Sometimes people say that I, I, I argue that the same. I, I never do. In fact, I, I'm very much against the idea that consciousness is just metacognition. I think they're distinct phenomena. 
but and yet there are these overlaps. So it would be nice to have a theoretical account to 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 spell out how they are related. Um, okay, sorry, my slides are a little funny. Um, and then so today I would use um, um, uh, in the spirit of doing cognitive science, I'll use a, an analogy from a kind of neural network uh, that has been pretty successful and, and very influential in the past decade. And I'll use that to help us to think about how it all works, um, how consciousness and metacognition and may be related. So this kind of network is sometimes called a, a generative adversarial network. So to those of you who've been you know, reading or dabbling in that literature, of the, explo the explosion of deep learning literature, uh, you, would, you, would, you would have some idea what I'm talking about. So basically we all know that the brain is not just you know, bottom up. It's not just feed forward, right? The, 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 uh, the visual system, uh, instead of just taking information from, from the outside world and then, and then just you know, synthesize them and then come up with a decision what it is. There is also the, the, re the reverse uh, information flow that is from the top down. You have you probably generate hypotheses about what the what the uh, external world is like, and you test your ideas. Sometimes it's loosely called predictive coding um, as an umbrella term for this sort of stuff, or you can just say basically there is top down processes involved in in, in perception. The problem is training your neural network models to do this kind of top down uh, prediction is hard. So it takes a lot of data. So that's why a lot of the current uh, neural networks for let's say facial recognition, you just want to recognize whether it's a, a male or female face and, and make this kind of hot and fast binary uh, categorizations. You, you, you tend to only use uh, bottom up feed forward networks. And because the generator is just hard to build. And it turns out Ian Goodfellows uh, had created a trick, I think that was Stuart when he was doing his PhD and he created a trick and he called it this uh, adversarial setup. So essentially you have a generator that try to uh, generate this top-down uh, 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 generation. That is, you take an idea of a face and you try to generate uh, an example face uh, within your own uh, network architecture. And as I said, that that is doable, but it just takes a lot of data to train such a network. And, and the trick about a GANs generated adversarial network is that you train another thing called the discriminator. The discriminator is like a forgery detector. So essentially the discriminator just look at the generated image and say whether this is actually self-generated or whether it's actually from the outside world. If self-generated, then it will call it, okay, this is a fake. So the forgery isn't good enough, it's been detected. Uh, so they would kind of penalize the, the generator for failing to fool the discriminator about its generation. Whereas if the generator generated an internal uh, image that is actually uh, very similar to an external uh, actual image, let's say imagine CAD and in, in that, that the representation is so good that the discriminator failed to catch the forgery, then the, then the discriminator get punished for a point and the, discriminator, and the generator gains a point. So when you set up this kind of adversarial com competitive uh, context, then both of these networks kind of learn to grow very fast. The good thing is the discriminator is simple, right? So we know how to build a discriminator. There's the discriminator is just like a binary classification network. You just look at an image and say whether it is, you know, type A or type B, type A being self-generated, type B being externally uh, um, authentic. Um, so, so this way you can have these two networks and, and, and they would learn to, to, to grow very fast together. And this kind of thing has become pretty standard. And Ian Lacoon, the, the head of AI research at Facebook calls it one of the coolest trick in machine learning in, in the past decade. And I think that's right. So the idea is, do we have this discriminator in the brain? Uh, and I think we do. Um, and that's, that, that makes it kind of interesting. So here's a, a paper from uh, a monkey uh, uh, invasive physiology study. So what these people did is they did a memory task. So the, the monkey has to remember the, the, the direction of some motion and then held it in, 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 in the mind. Uh, for uh, uh, one or two seconds. And then afterwards there is a test and then you're being shown two patches and you have to say which, which, which patch has a direction that is the same as the sample you remember a couple of seconds ago. So if you do that, um, then, then of course, you, during this memory delay somewhere in the brain, you need to have a representation of the, of the uh, content of this direction. And of course, not surprisingly, you can actually find this kind of uh, working memory representations in the brain in, in, in different areas. 
Uh, you can find it in the visual area, but you can also find it in the prefrontal cortex. And that's what these people record from. So they record it from the prefrontal cortex and find these uh, uh, find neurons that can actually ac accurately predict the memory delay content. And, and that, that reflects the probability of delay because if, it, if, if the neurons are not firing well, then on those trials, the, the animal will probably fail the memory task. And then as a control or comparison, they have a different task, which is just completely identical, except that during this delay period, the motion never went away. So there's no, basically no, no working memory demand there. And all you have to do is just, just look at the screen. So the, 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 um, during this memory delay, they can not call it a perceptual delay because the content is right on the screen. So you can actually look at it. And the monkey would, of course, look at it and, and just do this very simple task. And if you do that, then you can also find neurons all over the brain uh, um, in many areas that can actually predict this content, which is on the, right on the screen. And of course, you can find it in the visual cortex and also in the, in the prefrontal cortex. Now, the interesting thing is in the prefrontal cortex, now you have neurons that code for the memory content and you have neurons that code for the perceptual content. But turns out there are different populations of neurons. They're in the same area, but they're different neurons, largely different. I mean, some very small overlap. So what it means is you, in the prefrontal cortex, in other words, you have neurons that code for the content of what you are seeing or remembering. But the neuronal identities, which neurons are active, would help you to distinguish whether it is a content in your memory or in the external world. OK, so that is a lot like the discriminator to me. The discriminator exactly is, is a mechanism whereby some of the neuronal firing or some of the inner workings would reveal that whether um, uh, some content is generated by yourself, you know, as maintained by yourself in a working memory, or is it triggered ex externally right that moment. So that actually led myself and other people like Sam Gershman at Harvard to think, well, maybe exactly you can actually write down the math and model the uh, discriminator function in GANs as, as if it is being implemented in the prefrontal cortex. And he's already called it the prefrontal discriminator. So, OK, that's a bit of background uh, where we start. So this is the empirical stuff that I, I would mostly uh, kind of assume is correct. And, and I'll, I'll go from there and try to introduce how this can help us to understand uh, consciousness. And in fact, how this can actually, all of this can be taken as a pretty strong foundation for understanding uh, uh, a theory like Rosenthal's uh, higher order theory. And I call it differently. I call it perceptual reality monitoring theory, uh, in part because here is um, I'm speaking at Yale. And of course, uh, Marsha Johnson uh, famously also used a very similar phrase, reality monitoring, to refer to a similar function in memory. And I, I just basically took this idea and give it a little twist and, and call it perceptual reality monitoring. So the idea is entirely stolen from her. And, and Basically, the, the basic idea is also very similar to higher order theory, but I try to put it in, in terms of uh, as close to cognitive neuroscience as possible. So let's watch a video. This is um, one of my favorite. Um, so this is a video of uh, uh, not a monkey, but uh, an ape, uh, I believe, um, who was um, being presented with a little trick. So the ape found it. The, uh, the little ball's gone. You crazy guy. Yeah. So it looks like that the the animal obviously can end can can. Is, is, is amused by the trick, right? So the animal knows that something funny is going on. And you can do it to your own little pets if you have one. Um, and, and turns out, I think dogs and cats, they look like that they can appreciate similar kind of magic tricks. I mean, sleight of hands. They know that something is funny. And why do I show this? Well, I, when I first watched this, I, I asked myself, is there any way that this monkey is not conscious? Oh, this, this ape, sorry, is not conscious. This, this animal is not conscious, as in, not con I mean, obviously, it's moving around, it's behaving. So, by certain definition, it's conscious. It's not. It's not in a coma. But I mean, does this animal have subjective experience like we do? Does it have qualitative subjective experience, or is it just a very complicated automata? And I would say, well, it must have subjective experience in some ways, like we do. 
in the sense that it cannot be just like seeing all of this, like a blindside patient. A blindside patient is someone with a lesion to the primary visual cortex. So you can actually sensor information. You can guess where things are. You can guess what things are, but you don't have the subjective experience. And I would say this animal could not be just having super blind sight. I think the animal actually has conscious vision. And why would I say that? Well, imagine if I say that, well, there's a magician who specializes in, you know, pulling rabbits out of hats, but he presents it always like in a mask condition, like using backward masking. So we present these tricks subliminally. So you don't actually ever see the trick consciously, but the tricks are presented and the tricks are presented to you subliminally. So it's registered in your brain. Um, I would say that this kind of magician does not really exist or it doesn't make sense to call it magic in that case. There is no such a thing as subliminal magic. Um, the reason I say that, I mean, this, all of this is a bit of un intuition unpacking, but what I mean is, well, the reason when the magician pulled a rabbit out of a hat, it is so interesting and so magical, if you will. I mean, I'm talking about stage magic, not real magic, obviously. But the reason is because the um, when you see the the mat, when you see the rabbit, you immediately form this kind of belief that there is a rabbit, and this is actually our very general, uh, maybe even fundamental principle of our conscious perception. When you consciously see a rabbit, you form immediately form this belief, or some we can call it a perceptual belief, that there is a rabbit and the important thing is this belief is formed automatically. You're not trying to make an inference like using some logical training that you, you learn from your philosophy classes and say, well, I, I have this logic, I have this rabbit uh, um, in my uh, representation in my head and I infer that there's a rabbit. You don't have to do any of that. Automatically, it occurs to you that there's a rabbit. And this is also a belief that is not like your neurons believe that there is a rabbit. You as a person believe that there is a rabbit. And the third aspect, I think, is the most um, uh, maybe controversial. I, I use the term slightly differently from what philosophers would call it. I don't mean to say your belief is actually justified. It might be, but I think it's subjectively justified in the sense that it seems to make sense to you. If I ask you, why do you think there's a rabbit? Well, because I see it. Uh, because I see it. So you're, you're consciously seeing the rabbit is somewhat as providing you a, a sense of subjective rationality. So it seems to make sense to believe what you see. Um, and I and I think this only happens when it's consciously seeing, right? If you only have a subliminal registration of some information in your head, you don't form this belief, uh, not automatically. Even the blindside patient who end up believing that what 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 he or she guesses would be right, they form this belief through some sort of ex steps of logical inference. They don't immediately form this belief, and it doesn't feel rational to believe in those beliefs. That's why the blindside patient would say, "I'm just guessing." Okay, so how do you account for this? I think um, this is where the higher order theory comes in. And so you, the idea is you have a rabbit representation, uh, you, have, you have neurons uh, coding for rabbit uh, in your temporal visual areas. And those neurons on their own are not sufficient for you to form this belief, nor are they sufficient for you to have any con conscious experience. When you have conscious experience, what you need is also this, what I call higher order representation, essentially somewhere in your uh, late stage, more symbolic level processing, presumably, uh, or possibly in the prefrontal cortex, having a representation to the effect that this rapid representation, sorry, this rapid representation is reflecting here and now. Okay, now it sounds like a little bit philosophical, fancy footwork. It doesn't, what, what does it do? Well, I maintain that this is actually not so philosophical. This is actually a very useful way to think about the, the brain, uh, how prefrontal um, uh, circuits may contribute to perception. Because there are other scenarios where you clearly don't have this higher order representation. As I mentioned earlier, in blindside patients, you probably don't have this, right? So when you, in blindside, you probably have the, the, the representation of a rabbit. That's why blindside patients can guess whether, whether it's a rabbit or no rabbit or rabbit or cat in front of them, well above chance. So they pro presumably have this first order representation of a rabbit. But what they lack is some sort of higher order uh, mechanism suggesting that this is reflecting the here and now. And that's why correspondingly, they don't believe that the rabbit representation reflects are here now, there is no subjective experience and they don't form these beliefs uh, automatically. And then you can think about the, the other case, which is less bizarre than, than blindside, but more, much more common, which is working memory. So if you're just holding the image of a rabbit uh, in your mind and, and then now the, the rabbit is gone, but you try to remember what it's like, maybe you try to hold it for 10 seconds and then try to draw it out later or try to compare it with another 
uh, image of another rabbit. While you're doing this, you also don't confuse that with seeing a rabbit, right? You're, you, you know that you're holding it in your mind because presumably some higher order mechanism uh, via the efference copy or something tells you, well, I'm just imagining this rabbit right now. I'm just holding this internally online. So therefore you don't actually confuse that with seeing a rabbit. And then now you, this gets a bit tricky because in working memory, when you're holding this image of a working of a rabbit in your mind, some people would say that you almost see a rabbit. There's a little bit of mental imagery there. Uh, yes, there is mental imagery. So maybe there's no, uh, I'm not arguing that there's complete lack of subjective experience in everybody. But what I maintain is that subjective experience is nothing like actually seeing, or maybe I shouldn't say nothing like, but it's not very much like seeing the actual rabbit. It's very different. And then there, there are uh, people, uh, actually a sizable group of people within the normal population that has a condition called uh, uh, aphantasia. And if you have this condition, you actually have no visual mental imagery. And yet those people don't seem to have trouble doing this kind of visual working memory task. So what I mean is if you ask those people with aphantasia, in fact, many of them didn't realize that they have the condition. They actually didn't realize that other people have very vivid imagery. They just don't. But if you ask them to hold an image of a rabbit in the mind, they, they don't have trouble doing that. So that means that for at least for some people, having this uh, uh, working memory representation of rabbit does not lead to any subjective experience at all, apparently. And something must be different. And I argue that this could be different because something in the prefrontal cortex in the higher order stage is different. Now, this is actually uh, another way to put it is to say, uh, sorry, there's one more condition that's important. So this condition is just when you have the, your rabbit neurons are just firing spontaneously, which also happens. For, so you know that your every neurons are never completely silent un unless you are really very severely uh, sedated uh, with, with very heavy dose of uh, anesthetics. Even when, in your sleep uh, or you're dosing off or whatever, your neurons are active. There's a baseline activity, right? So, and that, that doesn't cause us to hallucinate rabbits every now and then even though your rabbit neurons are not completely silent, even when you're listening to this talk and not thinking or not uh, actively imagining a rabbit, those neurons just fire. And you presumably, you need some sort of mechanism to also say, well, this is just internal noise. Uh, so this should not be uh, con confused with uh, actual rabbit perception. So in other words, you have these three uh, situations. You have presumably a prefrontal mechanism to tell whether something actually is reflecting here and now outside right now, or you are uh, holding this internally, or you are um, this, this is just noise, right? So you have these three different attitudes you're gonna ascribe to, to this first order representation. So if you think about these two, then this is basically metacognition, right? This is distinguishing whether something is here and now, or it's just noise. Um, and if you think about these two, then this is basically the discriminator function. This is distinguishing self-generated or external trigger. So it's a lot like the discriminator in GANs. And I'm not gonna be able to ex expand on this a little bit more, but, um, but basically if you think about it, in the, in the, if, you, if you sort of dissect this kind of GANs network, once you train your network, uh, train a discipline to be able to, to tell the difference between self-generated and external trigger, then recycling that to do metacognition is very easy because the argument being that's something people would, would, would generally agree in, in, the, in the GANs world. If you can train the network so that the discriminator can actually tell internal or external, by that time, the discriminator has al already all those rich statistics about what, what a first order representation is like in general. And at that point, trying to tell whether something is actual real or noise would be very easy. It comes basically for free. Um, so this is basically how I see metacognition and uh, discriminative function and consciousness might be related because you need this thing to determine the, the nature of your, your subjective experience to route this piece of first order information further downstream for belief formation, rational decision making, etc. cetera. So your, this mechanism is kind of like the interface between your perception and your cognition. And this also determines the nature of your experience, whether you have the experience or not experience, or just an experience that is like a self, like a, like a mental imagery situation that is self-generated. Um, and I maintain one more thing is this metacognition is subpersonal and implicit, and this point would become important a bit later on. Okay. So I always talk to um, uh, David Rosenthal about this, and he always insists, why don't I just use his theory instead of create this like new terminology? As I said, I never mean to contrive originality here. The idea is mostly 
come from him and, and my reading of Bill Lycan, et cetera. But I think there's a little bit of difference between uh, uh, some barefoot versions of a higher order thought theory here. So on some version of higher order thought theory, uh, you can think that, well, the, the higher order representation is not what I said. It's more like, I think I am representing a rabbit. Um, but I don't like that version so much because then you get into this trouble of working memory. So as I mentioned earlier, when you have working memory, you also think you're representing a rabbit. Right. You, you don't you. In fact, you, you, you definitely think so. Even for the fantastics, you're holding the working memory uh, uh, representation online about the rabbit. But you also think that you are holding this. So that doesn't give you uh, the subjective experience of seeing. So you need something that is a little bit different. And then there's a different problem here, which is I also don't like to characterize this as if it is duplicating the content of rabbit. I mean, you don't need to think about the rabbit in the higher order state. You can just say, well, those representations of rabbits, whatever it is, or those representations of whatever content is representing the state of here and now. So I, I also don't like to characterize it as if the prefrontal cortex just duplicate things again. I think that would be kind of silly. But I think the more important point is, is really that about, I, I don't think you, 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 you merely have a thought that you're representing is enough. You need something that is a bit different. And you might think the different could be uh, something like I'm, I'm having a, a belief that there's a rabbit. So um, that would deal with the working memory case, right? Because you have a first order representation of a rabbit. And if your high order representation necessary for you to have the subjective experience is that I believe there's a rabbit, then in the working memory case, you wouldn't have this belief, right? You, you, you don't believe that there's a rabbit. You just believe that I have see, I'm, I'm remembering a rabbit. So your high order content would be different. Uh, and you can have this, you can call higher order belief type of view. Uh, but I don't think it works so well either because I heard that there are people who ingest hallucinogens uh, for recreational purposes. So if you do, then you might see a cat on, this, on, 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 on the wall uh, uh, looking, looking like this. But for those people who do this for fun, uh, they obviously don't think that there's actually a cat. They know that they just you know, drop acid or whatever. They knew that this cat is not real. So trying to ident identify the subjective experience with the actual belief will be too strong. So in other words, trying to identify with the thought will be kind of too weak because sometimes with working memory, you have that thought, but you don't have the working memory. Trying to directly identify with the belief will be too strong because sometimes you also actually see a cat, have to have the experience of seeing a cat, but you don't really believe it. You know you're hallucinating. So that's why you exactly need something in between. You need something of a representation of this nature that gives you this very strong logical tendency to form this belief that there is actually a rabbit. But it's just a tendency. Is a, is a very strong basis, a logical basis and a tendency, but it doesn't de determine that you always have this belief because you can have some other background beliefs that would contradict. So you might have some other background belief that, oh, I just dropped acid this morning uh, or I'm in a magic show or something. Uh, that can actually lead you to reject this ultimate uh, step of inference and say, yes, these two together strongly suggests that there's a rabbit, but I have some other beliefs that contradict with these, so maybe I don't think there's actually a rabbit, okay? So that's the reason why I think the higher order representation should be of this nature. And just so since we are in here, we're kind of closer to philosophy, that we can dig a little bit deeper into this philosophical puzzle. This is from Donald Davidson's uh, famous quoted message, uh, passage uh, quoted everywhere, um, where he was kind of thinking about what's the relationship between our um, uh, perceptual representations and our beliefs. And the quote um, uh, goes like, uh, the relation between a sensation and a belief, a sensation meaning a, um, what I call a perceptual representation or first order representation, uh, between a sensation and a belief cannot be logical since sensations are not beliefs uh, or other propositional attitudes um, so that the, the point being that where well, your beliefs are kind of kind of like conceptual uh, propositions and your sensations or your subjective experience is just an experience. It, many people would argue that they don't have conceptual content. So the relations becomes a bit unclear. What then is the relation? The answer is, I think, obvious. The relation is causal. Sensations cause some beliefs and in this sense are the basis or ground of those beliefs. But a causal explanation of a belief does not show how or why the beliefs are justified. So what he means is, well, yes, your, your subjective experience caused these beliefs, uh, and it just seems to happen automatically, implicitly, um, and, and that's very fine. But that seems to get us into trouble because then the, those beliefs would, should not make sense. 
Uh, and he was, I think, talking about whether it actually makes sense. Uh, but I think it's also interesting, regardless whether our beliefs make sense, our beliefs about the world, our perceptual beliefs make sense. It also is funny that it, it feels like it makes sense anyway. So that is, is, a, is a puzzle that I think is still uh, in interesting to a lot of people. And I think here you kind of have an explanation, a, a solution to this puzzle. So let's say you have this, your first order beliefs are, or so your first order representations are, are highly pictorial and non-conceptual, et cetera. You just have a rabbit. And you have a more propositional, conceptual, and symbolic representation at this higher order level. So now you can see that together, even though this is not propositional, together they actually form the logical basis for you to draw this uh, uh, belief that can be conceptual. Uh, because the two of them basically are like two premises in, in a logical argument, right? So you have a picture of a rabbit on its own, doesn't say anything, it's just a, just, you know, just a picture. Uh, it doesn't say anything about what is true. It doesn't say about what something like this exists in the world. It's not, it's not a statement about the world. But if you add another uh, conceptual, conceptual representation and say, well, this reflects the state of the world right now, then of course, together, there are like two premises of a logical argument. Then of course, naturally, you should form this, uh, this, this uh, belief that there is a rabbit. It makes sense. Uh, so given these two in your head, so it makes sense for you to believe that. So it accounts for what I call the subjective justification. And in fact, if you add a bit of reliabilism here and think, well, this also tends to be a very reliable judgment. That is your metacognitive engine uh, tends to work pretty well. Uh, then actually objectively, this belief is justified as well, right? So you have this representation of a rabbit uh, and then you have this higher order representation, and you also have the background assumption that this higher order representation has been very reliable throughout your life. Then having this having this as actually justified, uh, in the absence of other contradictory uh, background beliefs, having this belief will be actually very justified. So now go back to uh, one more point about philosophy. Then I'll go back to science very soon. I'm not a real philosopher, but I'm just making some observations about the connections here. So Bill Lycan is uh, the person who got me into higher order theory, actually. Uh, although David Rosenthal became my trusted uh, friend and mentor and co-author, it was uh, Bill Lycan's book that got me into uh, higher order theories. And in Bill Lycan's book, I think in the uh, in the in the nineties. He has a slightly different version of a higher order theory, sometimes called higher order perceptual theory. So David Rosenthal has a version of the theory whereby the higher order representation is like a thought. It's like, I think I'm in certain state. Uh, not, not to be confused with normal actual conscious thoughts. I mean, just like a, a representation that is implicit and subpersonal, but is a thought-like structure. And uh, Bill Lycan argue for a view whereby the higher order representation is much more like a percept. Uh, so, so it actually links to an older theory uh, uh, called inner sense theory, whereby the higher order representation is like a, is like a percept. So you have a higher order sense organ sensing the first order sensory representations. If it senses it as in a certain way, then you have this higher order uh, 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 mechanism working. So you have uh, a subjective experience. Uh, but Bill Lycan actually, unfortunately, I think he has given up the view. And in part, that's due to a line of arguments that basically we haven't found this inner sense organ. There's no perceptual organ that looks into the, the uh, representations of other perceptual uh, modalities. But I would argue that if anything, the kind of metacognitive mechanism we have looked at is a bit like that. Because when I say metacognition, we have to think about two kinds of metacognition. One is the explicit kind that you actually think about your percept and then as a person, you, you make this judgment. But I, the kind of metacognition I've been talking about is really very implicit. It, it just happens to you, right? So when you, when you have a first order representation, you immediately, your brain somewhere knows that this representation is self-generated or externally triggered. It's not something you have to put, put in effort to do as a, as a person. It happens automatically. And in fact, I would argue that that mechanism not just is, is, is implicit, but in fact, is very much like the discriminator, what I talk about here. Um, and if, the, if, if that's right, then the discriminator, of course, is just a perceptual mechanism. As I mentioned earlier, the good thing about the GANS framework is nice is because training this discriminator is like is something that we already know. This is just a pattern recognition uh, categorization network. So we just look at the, the output of a generator and then just classify it as A or B. So it's just like, a, a, any, like, like an algorithm that recognizes a phase as male or female, uh, or Caucasian or non-Caucasian, et cetera. It just, it, it just does this kind of very simple perceptual bottom-up 
uh, classification. So in that sense, we actually might be reviving the, the, the idea that we do have an inner sense organ and we know anatomically where it is, we know its properties as well. So finally, on this point of uh, implicit versus explicit metacognition, uh, we, can, we can revisit that back in the, in the Q&A, but I think one thing is interesting to think about is, uh, is the case of uh, dreams, and in particular lucid dreams. I think that, that that's a helpful way to help to distinguish what I mean by uh, explicit and implicit metacognition. So if you think about dreams, which is basically a form of hallucinations, right? So in dreams, you are not seeing, you, you, you seem to be seeing things, you think that you're seeing things, you have subjective experience of objects and stuff, but they are not actually there in the world right now in front of you. So by definition, your dreams are uh, a kind of hallucination. And according to this framework would be a kind of uh, failure of implicit metacognition. That is, you might have the, you might be dreaming about your, um, your, your best friend. So you have the representation of the, your best friend's face uh, in the fusiform face area, a first order representation. And your high, order, your high order mechanism is fooling you or is failing. It, it, it just basically points at the, uh, addresses the first order representation and consider it a, a, a legit representation of the world right now, which is, we can call it a failure of implicit metacognition. Right, so all dreams are failures of implicit metacognition in that sense, because you fail to recognize your internally generated noise as such. You recognize it as if it is rep representing the world right now. But in lucid dreams, I think it's a very useful case to help to uh, tease apart the, the two concepts of explicit and implicit metacognition, because in lucid dream you obviously have uh, uh, functioning and uh, correctly functioning explicit metacognition, because you know that you are dreaming when you see your best friend's face. In, in, in your dream, your explicit metacognition is intact. You know that this is just a dream, but your implicit metacognition continue to fail. That's why you continue to have this experience as if you are seeing your friend right now. But at the same time, on an explicit level, you know that you are wrong. At the, at the implicit level, you, you hallucinate. So that's what I mean by the implicit and explicit. So lucid dream would be a good case to say your implicit fails, your explicit success. Uh, succeeds uh, in most usually in dreaming both fail because mostly when we're dreaming we didn't we don't know that we're dreaming okay um i can take a pause and take questions here uh or i can go ahead and go to this the uh, final part which i can um anticipate what it's about i would talk about i would i would this theory so far tells you when you're conscious when you're not but it doesn't tell you why there is any subjective characters of consciousness at all so i i would spend another five finally 10 15 minutes to to go through that part but maybe it's a good time to take some questions right here what do you think you're here um we usually do questions at the end because of the recording, but I can pause okay. the recording when yeah. we start it. If uh, no, in that case, if that's fine, if there's no burning question, then we can actually soldier on and try to try to do that too. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah. Good. So yeah, so I anticipated why, what is this for? So PRM, I've been happy with the theory for a while, and I know that it relates very well with the philosophical literature of higher order theory and also the empirical evidence. So I feel I've kind of forged a, a bridge there. And I feel that the science is legit. The philosophy is pretty strongly defensible. I mean, of course, in philosophy, there are always disagreements, but I think that those disagreements are okay. I think that the theory is way more popular, uh, I mean, way more accepted by experts than, than other crazier philosophy ideas. So I think we are on pretty um, good grounds there. But the problem of the theory that has been, uh, I think a lot of people find it unsatisfying uh, for two reasons. One is that people sometimes misunderstood it. They, they thought that we are equating consciousness with explicit metacognition. So I hope I made it clear now, we're not trying to say the subjective experience is what you think you are actually experiencing or what you uh, what your beliefs are. It's, it's, much, it's, it's an implicit level. It, it, it works a lot like explicit metacognition in the sense that we can analogize and use these labels and, and, and try to write down this, this higher order representation is doing this. But what we mean is we're not over, like, over intellectualizing consciousness. We, we are, we are, we are just saying that this is how it works, but it works at an implicit automatic level. So usually that convinced most of the people or stop, or stop a lot of skeptics, uh, critics from, from worrying about our theory. But the other concern I think is also real. The, the theory so far seems to say nothing about the, the subjective phenomenal quality. It tells you when you are conscious, but why, when you're seeing a cat, it, it looks a certain way. It's not just a representation, right? It's not just about forming beliefs. The cat looks a certain way or the redness of red looks a certain way. The painfulness of a sharp pain feels a certain way. And that has been kind of difficult. 
Um, and turns out, uh, again, these ideas have been articulated by the same kind of philosophers who, who are in the higher order theory can. And there's an idea called a mental quality space. And the idea is this. So if you, this is actually not, uh, this is just a standard uh, physical color space, right? So you can plot colors uh, on a space like this uh, and, 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 rank of, and, and arrange the colors uh, in terms of the standard, you know, RGB values or, or hue, saturation, brightness, some sort of physical dimensions. And then if you do that, then the, sim then the colors that are close to each other uh, on this space uh, uh, would be, would be uh, physically similar. And you can see that subjectively they look kind of similar too, right? So this color is, uh, this color is, mo is more like this color. So the neighboring colors are more subjectively similar. But what, imagine if this space is constructed entirely based on subjective similarity. So ignore all those physical properties like hue, saturation. Just try to put the similar colors together. And by similar to avoid uh, circularity, I can even define it functionally. I can say similar colors are colors that you are not very good at distinguishing. If I actually present it very briefly uh, or add some noise, then, then you, would, you would have a much harder time distinguishing. And those are called uh, subjectively similar in, in the sense of functionally similar. So you just put colors like this so you can form a space where the colors that are close to each other would be subjectively similar. And now having this space is actually very handy. So according to the uh, uh, philosophical idea that is called mental quality space theory, the what is likeness of your subjective experience, uh, that is if you want to describe why red looks the way it does, well, usually if you try to say, well, it's the phenomenal quality, but if you, if you drop all this jargon and try to explain what is the, the heart of the problem, we end up using a phrase that is what Thomas Nagel used, but we kind of twisted a little bit in the meaning here, which we end up asking, well, there is something it is like to see red, right? The famous what it is like to, to be a bad article. I'm, I'm twisting the concept a little bit, but I think in my teaching and my talking to lay, lay people who are outside this field, this phrase tends to really do the job the best. And, and, and the idea is, well, there is something it is like to see red and it's very hard to articulate. It's basically ineffable. It's not just a wavelength of a color. Uh, it's not, it's, you cannot say red is the color of roses. That, yeah, those, those are informative, but it doesn't tell you the, what it is like quality of seeing red. And that subjective quality seems ineffable. And what these mental quality uh, uh, theory people say is, well, in, in fact, this is actually not something so crazy. Uh, what red is like is red is a little, a little bit like orange, a little bit like pink, a little bit like uh, purple, uh, nothing like silver, nothing like the sound of thunder, nothing like uh, uh, a sharp pain, nothing like the uh, taste of chocolate, right? So what it is like to see red can be expressed in terms of these pairwise uh, similarity comparisons. But the problem, of course, is if you actually say it like what I do, it, it would not be very precise because I say a little bit like pink and a little bit like orange, but how like? So you should actually spell it out more precisely. You would say exactly uh, more like orange than like ping. You can rank them and spell that. But if, once you start doing that and spell out all the possible pairwise comparisons, you you would you would run out of time. Basically, you would it's, it's virtually impossible to spell it out in this form. But if you think about it in the space, though, that's that's actually much handier because just by pointing, a red is like a point here in this coordinate that already encapsulates all the pairwise comparison, right? So all the other, other colors on this space would, would be, you, you would know how much it is like the other color. So red is actually more like orange because it's closer to orange and closer to pink than to blue. Uh, and then you can think about this space is containing more than just color. You can think about all the, the, the space containing all the possible subjective experiences. So, so red would be very much unlike uh, the sound of uh, the middle C on the piano. And it will be very much unlike pain because they're, they're just so far apart. They're so easily they're so so easily distinguishable. They're not so confusable. So you know that they will be far apart. So by having such a space, then uh, if you can if you, if you can be shown that we actually represent our subjective experience on a space like this, it can account for why it is so rich subjectively. It seems so complex and phenomenal and rich, and yet it's so ineffable because you have to spell out all these pairwise comparisons in words, it would be impossible. But actually implicitly, if you just have this space in your head, then you would know that what it is like to see red. And this may be why this did, you have this so-called subjective character that seems so difficult to explain. Now then, the problem is, do we have this space in our head? 
so I said that there's a space uh, whereby things are compared uh, in, in these subjective similarity terms. You might think, well, this seems like just like fiction. It's just like a philosophical fiction. And a lot of people say, well, we don't have this space in our head. So if we don't even have the space, talking about a coordinate on a space it doesn't, doesn't help. It's like telling you an address uh, on a map, but you don't even have the map. But I argue that you actually have this map in your, in your head. Uh, in fact, it's very easy to see you've got to have it. Um, so the idea is this. I mean, uh, let me run you through uh, another analogy. If I tell you that um, two words uh, in your um, um, in your dictionary uh, have a very similar address, if uh, they actually both are on page uh, 120 and uh, they they are both on the top of the page, uh, one is two line about the others. Well, then you can already basically guess how similar they would be in terms of the spelling, right? Because of the organization of the of the of the dictionary, you know that if two words have these similar addresses, meaning the page number and line numbers, they would be very likely to share the first three letters. You can you can even guess if you know the dictionary very well. You can actually even say, well, page hundred and twenty that must be starting with a D. Uh, and if you tell me the line numbers, I can basically guess what what the word might be. Um, so that is to say, if you actually have a system whereby the addresses are very systematic. By telling you that two content has very similar address, you already know that how much they are like each other, how much they are easily distinguishable. And earlier I talked about the, the prefrontal cortex presumably referring to the uh, first order representation, rabbit, uh, wh whatever, et cetera, using some kind of address system. It doesn't actually duplicate the content. It would say, well, those neurons over there uh, they represent the world right now. But of course, I mean, the prefrontal cortex doesn't speak. I mean, I'm just trying to analogize and try to try to, try to to describe what it, what it does. Obviously, it's much more likely to have some sort of addressing, indexing system, like how prefrontal cortex and, and hippocampus works as, as we know it. So these systems presumably refer to neurons where those neurons were for certain, let's say, you, let's say there's a number system, which of course, is just something that we try to use to understand the brain. Let's say the prefrontal cortex say, well, those neurons uh, three to uh, 15 in the sensory uh, cortex, uh, is rep they are representing the state of the world right now. And then the, the, presumably the function is for the prefrontal cortex to pass on this information to downstream areas like hippocampus, where you try to encode episodic memory or other areas where you try to make decisions. So the other area would say, well, I've got it. So those neurons in area, uh, uh, in the visual cortex, in uh, the neurons three to, three to 15, those neurons are very likely representing the world right now. So that, that's why the prefrontal cortex is kind of like the gating mechanism directing further downstream processes. And, and, and that I, I, I argue is what the, the, the discriminator or the higher order process is doing. If, if that's true, then having those neurons, th those neuron address is already extremely useful. If the neuron, for the PFC to say, well, these neurons uh, are three to 15 are, are representing the world right now, because of the way the sensory cortex is organized, the, the neurons that are next to each other tend to pose similar things, right? So the neurons that are uh, close to each other, they have similar uh, receptive fields, they code similar content. So red and pink actually would overlap with, uh, with so many neurons, right? So in the population coding scheme, your red neurons and the pink neurons actually partially overlap and your blue neurons would be in a, in a, in a pretty, would involve a rather different population and your pain neurons would be in a totally different cortical area. So just by having similar neuronal addresses, the brain actually know how similar these two um, uh, sensory representations are subjectively. So that's why I mean, when I say the, the PFC, if, if, if you can address these uh, uh, activities in this way and say neurons feed three to 15 or neurons 100 to 120, if you can address it this way, it's a lot like addressing content in your dictionary. So in that sense, implicitly, you already have something a lot like a mental quality space. Okay, so this is a little bit difficult point to to um, to make clear, but I maybe I, it would help if I can actually run through two other uh, uh, animal coding uh, system just to wrap up uh, to tell you what it really does. So in the fruit flies, um, the olfactory system has been studied a lot. And we know that we have uh, uh, numerous uh, receptors and then they project to the mushroom body and then the, there's the canyon cells. Uh, the canyon cells actually do these very weird things called uh, a random projection. So you have um, um, all these different uh, uh, neurons at an early stage 
uh, coding the different odors, coding different receptors. And then at some point, it just seems to randomly project to uh, a, a layer of neurons called the canyon cells. And, and, and then at, at, at this level, uh, there is then a, a kind of winner takes all uh, mechanism. You take, just look at all these neurons and see which one is firing the most and then ignore the rest, basically threshold and take the, take the most strongest activated and then use it to make a decision as to what order it is. Um, and this particular procedure uh, has been studied a lot uh, by, by even computer scientists. It turns out that this is actually a very useful way uh, for, 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 for the animal or for a circuit to actually do two functions. One is a similarity search. So odors that are similar would end up project. So it looks random, but it's actually turned out it's not completely random. Uh, turns out that the odors that actually are similar would actually project to a very similar canyon cell. So they have a high likelihood of overlapping. So you can use this to solve the, a, a problem in computer science called uh, um, uh, similarity search. That is, if I give you an odor, you now have this a canyon cell. If you have to now come up with an odor that is very similar to this, all you have to do is to think about what other neurons, uh, what other uh, odors are represented by, by, by the same canyon cells. Uh, then you can actually pull up a similar uh, odor and say, well, this, this, this is, this, this, when another odor also activates the same uh, canyon cells, so I would say that that odor would be similar. And this kind of similarity search turned out to actually out, outperform uh, even existing computer algorithms. If you take all these motifs from the fruit flies. And another thing you can do uh, would be easier to understand would, would be it, it's kind of with this kind of canyon cell coding system, you can also do novelty detection. So let's say you, you're familiar with this canyon cell uh, coding. You now say that this odor activate this, another odor activate that. But now you have a new, new canyon cell pattern that happened to you have never seen before, then you will know, well, this, this odor must be new. This mix of receptor activation has never been activated before. Uh, then, then you know that this is new. Again, this, there's some, a bit of computer science uh, uh, work done on there using this to, to, as a, to taking the motif from the fruit fly olfaction and say that this is actually a good way to do novelty detection as well. So the, the important point here is this layer has been called random projection. So in the sense that if you look at the, the uh, olfactory coding, uh, in fact, Richard Axel uh, often make this point, the Nobel Prize he won based on, based on this work, also emphasized this point that sometimes it looks like um, the, um, the olfactory system is much more random than the, than the visual cortex. The visual cortex is like a piano. It just lays out everything in this very orderly fashion in a spatial fashion. But turns out that the, 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 the canon cells, even though they look like they're random, but actually if you analyze it computationally, it's very systematic. So you can just think of the, the canyon cells here is a lot like the visual cortex. The wiring is highly systematic, but you just spatially scramble the, the neurons without scrambling the wiring. Okay, so you just, let's say you move the, 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 the neurons in your visual cortex around, but keeping all the connections. Then the retinotopic mapping wouldn't work anymore. It would look like that is all over the place. It looked like it's salt and pepper. But if you keep the wiring systematic, you will have this kind of spatial structure uh, internally, or I call it a spatially analog structure, even though you can observe the spatial structure as an experimenter, as an anatomist, but the internal structure is still there. So why I emphasize this point? Because you, you, you can contrast this with the mantis shrimp. The mantis shrimp has a different uh, uh, coding system for color sensation. So the, the mantis shrimp has actually uh, over a dozen uh, color receptors. So it's actually more than what we have. So it actually has, you know, several folds more, uh, many more color receptors than we do. But turns out the mentistrim is not very good at doing color discrimination. And it has only been recently uh, uh, understood why. The reason is they have these different receptors and then they don't, they don't go through this uh, canyon cell like projection system. They don't actually mix them. There's no opponency. They just like recognize these dozens of color receptors as independently like independent label lines. So they have 12 different channels and the channels don't mix. So in this sense, it's kind of almost like coding colors by symbolic uh, coding. It doesn't have this spatially smooth analog system. So this, the mantis stream accordingly, you can imagine it cannot do similarity search. If I tell you that, okay, this color is now being, act is being activated, what is a similar color? The mantis stream, even if you assume the mantis stream is very clever, uh, at the sensory level, it just doesn't have the machinery to tell you what things are similar. They're just 13 different things or 14 different things, depending on the species, a dozen of different things. They cannot tell you which one is more similar to which. And it also cannot do novelty detection. 
So these dozens of, 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 of detectors, they're either on or off. You can't tell what is a new thing. It doesn't tell you that this is a new mix because it doesn't have this space. So what I mean is having more receptor is not the key. Having the receptor spatially laid out is not the key, but having the wiring so you can mix things where the address becomes meaningful. The Canyon cells is kind of like your address where you can say, well, this address and the address next to it in, in terms of the addressing system would give you something similar. This is what gives you the mental quality space. Um, I have a point about the cerebellum, but I'm, I think I'm going to skip that. So some people think that it's fascinating that the content in the cerebellum is not conscious. Uh, it's not so clear that it's true, but to the extent it's true, I think it's nicely accounted for by this structure too, by this argument too. Basically, the cerebellum has these loops that are that looks a bit like the mantis stream system. They're independent. They don't mix so well like, like the sensory system. The sensory system has this kind of smooth analog system where the similar address really tells you how similar the content they are. And they are kind of analog. They're not, they're not like third, they're not like 13 different colors. They are like really a color space that can be smooth because they mix because of opponency and mixing. So let me wrap up. Um, basically, I uh, try to argue that the spatial layout in the sensory cortex allow this kind of uh, mental quality quantity space address because of this functional smoothness. So in neural network, in fact, people call it just smoothness. Uh, and, it, and it's a property not of anatomy, it's just of the wiring of the functioning. So I call it functional smoothness. So essentially, you can defend this in philosophical terms, you have a functionalist account of all of that. And the qualities uh, are by themselves not phenomenally conscious because you also need this kind of higher order mechanism, uh, what I call a perceptual reality monitor that, that, high, that help you to monitor the, the first order signals and decide whether the first order signal with this kind of smoothness function, you're knowing what it's like, whether it is actually um, um, reflecting the world right now. If it decides that it is reflecting the world right now, then you have the subjective experience. Um, and, and at some point, I also emphasize on this point that the reason that you, 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 want, you want to have this is because your higher order mechanism presumably signal for downstream areas uh, to, to do other things about that first order of content. So let's say your prefrontal cortex might be communicating with an episodic memory system and say, well, those neurons with the address uh, seven to 14, uh, they represent the world right now. So we should encode it into your episodic memory system. So when they talk to each, each other, essentially your brain has this internal language of these addresses, which implicitly tells you what things are like. So inside your head, you have this, what we can call a phenomenal language whereby the different areas communicate by referring to the neuronal addresses of this functionally smooth system. And that's how subjective experience may come about. It sounds like a crazy theoretical uh, uh, detour, but I, I hope to convince you these are ideas that have been taken in philosophy, have been defended in philosophy. I think they are far less crazy than some of the other more metaphysical uh, philosophical ideas we have today uh, that, are, that are also popular, like panpsychism. Uh, and yet, this, these philosophical ideas, although they're very old, they're actually very compatible with the known uh, science that we have right now about the brain and, and, and psychology. So with that, um, thank you very much.